This is Winchester Academy. With that, I get to introduce a special friend of mine, uh, Dr. Tom Tatlock. Uh, his uh, Training was at the University of Kansas for undergraduate and medical school, and then uh, an internal medicine residency and a psychiatry residency in Madison, and uh, we managed to hook him and retain him in Appleton, and that's uh, where his practice was. He, uh, he's here with his wife, Andrea, tonight. I lost track of Andrea way in the back corner, in the Bach Euchre seats. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Tom and Andrea have uh, twin boys, now grown and doing well. Um, and uh, my relationship with Tom goes back to about 1979. At that time, the University of Wisconsin decided to put a family practice residency program in Appleton. And uh, I called the uh, newly appointed director and said, I would enjoy doing some part-time teaching. And uh, so, for a while, I was going over there one day a week. Jerry remembers those days. Um, and uh, what he needed was somebody to put together a behavioral medicine rotation, a program, a course curriculum, and do the teaching. And Tom and I were assigned to be a team, and that's how I got to know Tom, got to be good friends with Tom, and uh, came to admire his talents greatly. And uh, over the years, uh, he was my go-to guy for my patients to refer to. Uh, he uh, he uh, had a, a solid background in psychiatry, but also a great way of communicating and didn't use uh, what some of us call psychobabble. Uh, and he could uh, be well understood by my patients. And, uh, whoops. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, so, after a while, we went our separate ways, like you do with college friends, kind of lost track of each other. And when his name was recommended as a potential speaker for the Winchester Academy, I was ecstatic. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to introduce Tom and let him take over. Thank you very much, Terry. I certainly, uh, yeah, I think that um, I have fond memories of starting the family practice residency there. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to so many people about traumatic brain injury. I've become kind of an evangelist educator about traumatic brain injury. Uh, I didn't know much about traumatic, I didn't know much about brain injury until I was introduced to it. Uh, I fell off a ladder, but that story will come a little bit later. And, and I want to talk some about how it's a public health issue as, as well as an individual health issue. Uh, this is basically what I hope to cover tonight. Um, and have some time for questions and answers. Traumatic brain injury is one form of an acquired brain injury. An acquired brain injury just means that it can't be congenital, it can't be hereditary, it can't be caused by uh, the birth itself, and it's not degenerative. That's one of the things that separates it from something that is associated with traumatic brain injury at times, uh, CTE or chronic tra traumatic encephalopathy. Traumatic brain injury may be a cause of that, but it's a s distinctly different collection of uh, problems. Traumatic brain injury is really defined as uh, an injury to the brain or a change in brain pathology, the brain's ability to function, caused by an outside force, an external force. And that force doesn't have to have contact with the skull. You can think of examples like whiplash, uh, blast injuries for people who are returning from um, the conflicts in the Middle East and Afghanistan. Um, Also, it's important to know it 
you don't have to lose consciousness. Uh, in fact, concussions are really mild traumatic brain injuries. So there are a lot of brain injuries, uh, but there are a lot that just spontaneously uh, resolve. And I didn't know a lot of this before I started to learn. And I was amazed that you know, 2.8 million people at least have uh, traumatic brain injury. And that is probably a marked uh, underestimation because that doesn't count anybody who's treated in a federal facility. So you don't count any of the veterans. You don't count anybody in the VA system. And more importantly, you don't count any of the people who are treated by their family physicians. Whoops. I don't know how that happened. You'll see my limited computer skills as we go on. Uh, but it doesn't count people who are treated in their own physician's office or people who seek no treatment at all. And I think that's a very high number. Uh, and you can see some of the public health problem in just the number of people who are on long-term disability from traumatic brain injury. At least 5.3 million people are. And to give you an idea of uh, traumatic brain injury compared to, say, breast cancer and HIV and spinal cord injury, when I first saw these statistics, I was so skeptical, I, I really couldn't believe them. So what I did was I went back and looked at the, the Center for Disease Control, and, and these are, in fact, the right numbers. Uh, 2.8 million for traumatic brain injury. You can see I don't know how to do graphs, so I have the old 15, 1,500,000. 1, and, and breast cancer has 244,000. Uh, each year. And um, spinal cord is more like 17,000, and HIV is uh, something I didn't write down on. Uh, uh, so we'll have to just take it by uh, faith, I guess. And this is, uh, I'm not going to talk about what physicians frequently use, which is called the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a scale of neurological function that ranges from 3 to 15. And that usually is a number given to the person when they're first seen, which may or may not have a lot of relevance to their long-term outcome. The lowest score you can get is 3. The highest score you can get is 15. And um, below uh, 8 is uh, or three to five is uh, moderate, or you know, 13 to 15 is uh, mild, uh, eight to 12 is um, moderate, and below eight is uh, severe. And this has to do, can you get the person respond to pain? Can they open their eyelids? Uh, can they respond to verbal command commands? These, I think, are a lot more easily understood. The mild is, you know, you lose consciousness for up to an hour. But the important thing is to know that you don't have to lose consciousness. And the other thing is the person may not know that they lost consciousness because of what's next, which is called post-traumatic amnesia, which means that you're confused. You don't have a memory for that. So many may have fallen down. Uh, I think this often happens where TBI may have occurred in children, but they don't know. They're out playing in the playground. They fall off a. Uh, head first off monkey bars or something. They don't really know that something happened. And then the moderates are one hour to one day, and post-traumatic amnesia is one day to one week. Severe is greater than a day and greater than a week. And I think the thing to think about with traumatic brain injury, it can vary markedly in severity from almost no <laughs> symptoms and no awareness to being lifelong uh, vegetative state, uh, incapacitated in many ways. So it varies in intensity and also in um, severity. The, the reason for thinking about uh, the level of severity is uh, only 10% are severe. And those are usually pretty easily diagnosed, with the exception if the severe traumatic brain injury happens to somebody who is in a, a motor vehicle accident or some other kind of accident and they have a lot of physical problems, and people pay attention to all the life-threatening problems, and then they discover the TBI later on, maybe about the time the person is going to be discharged. 
the moderates are iffy as far as uh, diagnosis. Sometimes those are fairly easy, sometimes they're not. Just because you have moderate or severe does not mean that you end up seeking help. Doesn't mean that you're in the hospital, doesn't mean that uh, you've been treated in any way. And the mild is, you can see, 2,240,000. And the, to me, the thing is there's, if you look at the people who continue to have symptoms from the mild traumatic brain injury, that's almost equal to the numbers of the severe and the moderate. Uh, this group of 15 to 25 percent of people <clears throat> who don't completely recover, they're called the miserable minority. And, and this is a club I'm a member of. I would never ask anybody else to join. Uh, I think one reason people have views of uh, brain injury that are maybe inaccurate is say 75% spontaneously recover and return to normal within a few weeks to a few months. The other thing is people have said to me, gee, you know, I thought people who had brain injuries looked like people who had strokes. They had some paralysis, they had some visible identifying thing, and that's just not the case. Uh, I think of this, they, its name is the silent epidemic. I think of it as the invisible epidemic. My sense is if I met you in some kind of non-setting like this, and we were simply having a casual conversation, my hope would be that you wouldn't have any idea that I had a brain injury. I've learned a lot of strategies to camouflage uh, the extent of deficits and to make myself, well, I was going to say look normal, but I, I think maybe back to what my former self was <laughs> is a safer way of saying that. And there's some populations that have really high risks. The 20% of the veterans, that is not just the people who are in the conflicts in the Middle East and Afghanistan, um, and the homeless. This really surprised me. Uh, I, for a long time, had thought the major cause of homelessness was mental illness and substance abuse. But I'll talk about that later, but uh, there's some very good studies about this. And the prisoner population, that, that's done in a number of different states where people have gone in and evaluated prisoners in different uh, penal institutions. And the numbers range in this area. And I think probably the consensus number is about 60%. And we'll talk about what the deficits are as far as planning, awareness, uh, memory concentration that come from a brain injury. But it, there, in my mind, is probably a connection between the deficits and why people get caught. And those of us who are over 75 and those of us who are under four were the high risk groups for traumatic brain injury. And in fact, the fastest growing group of people who acquire brain injuries now are people over 75. And we get that usually from falls. It's what usually happens to the younger people under four years old. The range for the 15 to 45 is much more, is a different cause much more likely to be vehicle accidents, uh, fights, uh, impulse control issues. Uh, so the, the causes, falls are number one, motor vehicles are number two. It used to be the other way around, and I think as the aging population uh, goes along, uh, the falls will continue to be something, maybe the kind of thing that makes you think about how to fall proof your home and stuff it has done that for me. Well, I'm going to talk, I've showed you a lot of statistics, and my belief is statistics are just people with the tears wiped away. You, you don't get the sense of what it happens to an individual who has a brain injury when you just hear the statistics I gave you. And I'm going to tell you my particular story because it's the one I know uh, best, and it's not necessarily typical, and I think if you begin to have a one of my goals out of this would be if you come away from this evening with a bigger definition of what might a brain injury look like. Well, on May 19th, we had our car all packed, loaded. We were going to go to our son's graduation from college in Vermont. And I was just going to do a nice thing. I was, took down the storm window, was putting up a screen for somebody who worked in it, was going to work in our bathroom so they wouldn't be hot and uncomfortable. Well, I fell off a ladder and put the back of my head on a concrete sidewalk. 
and this was kind of the start of you get to choose dumb, dumber, or dumbest. I came in and washed my head off under the kitchen sink, used a little squirter hose, wrapped a towel around it, and said to my wife, let's go to Vermont. And she said, let's go to the hospital. She was right, but I can tell you the recipient of good advice is not always grateful for the advice. <laughs> uh, I was in the hospital. I was seen in the emergency room by the emergency room physician and by a neurosurgeon. They did a CT scan of my head. Uh, they did a neurological kind of thing. The 13 to 15 I was talking about as far as the Glasgow sco coma scale. I scored a 15, which meant I was fine. There wasn't any problem. They asked me, did you lose consciousness? I said at that time, no, but I'm convinced that I gave the wrong answer because I just wasn't aware. I became more aware later on of how confused I was. I didn't feel all that bad when we were sitting in the hospital uh, emergency department. But by the time they decided uh, to do the CAT scan, I think in part because we were leaving town, uh, the neurosurgeon saw a subdural hematoma, the radiologist saw a subarachnoid bleed. So they had admitted me to the hospital. By the time I got up to the ward and into the hospital bed, I really was beginning to feel terrible. I felt like I'd had a steel rod driven through my right eye coming out of the back of my head. I was beginning to have nausea and vomiting. I began to have something I had, late, had subsequently, which is the worst physical pain I've ever had. It's kind of, oops, kind of like uh, the worst case of the flu you had multiplied by 100. Everything ached. Everything was terrible. And so I was in the hospital overnight. They did another CT scan in the morning. Uh, people came around and they said, your CT scan is unchanged. You can go home. Now, this took me a little bit by surprise. And they said, you can even fly to Vermont. Now, I want to put this in context. This was, you know, 1999. Things have improved. People's knowledge has increased. Um, so I was having a lot of nausea and vomiting. And this kind of moves into the dumb, dumber category. I solved that problem by not eating. <laughs> and so we had some friends that I stayed with overnight. And they took me to the airport. And I flew to Chicago. and went through O'Hare in a wheelchair, which is, and then uh, flew on to Vermont. Well, our son's graduation, I was there in, in body, and part of me was really pretty functional. I, I got along with his girlfriend and her family, and probably better than I would have in my normal state. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't smart aleck, he wasn't. Uh, but I had these terrible headaches, and I had this excruciating pain and I had what was just uh, fatigue. And then I returned to work, tried to return to work. I came back, from, and we have another son who was at Georgetown. We went down to Washington, D.C. Uh, by then, I was just really in incapacitated. I was really just laying in the motel room, went to his Phi Beta Kappa award ceremony. But the three, Andrea and Scott and Ward, went and did things. I just really was non-functional. So I came back and I saw the uh, nurse clinician for the neurosurgeon and she did a quick exam. She said, you're neurologically intact. You should be back to your normal self within about six weeks. Well, I'm still not back to my normal self. Uh, so I went back to work and I, um, I think I could work as long as I did because I could control the environment. Before this injury, I probably would work 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day. After this injury, I began to work. Uh, I had what I call the lost month, which is for a month I just stayed home and slept and felt pain. But I tried to go back to work. And I could see a patient, and then I had to lay down. I could see somebody for an hour or a half hour. Then I had to literally physically rest and to deal with the headache and deal with the pain. I really had to lay down. And this, you know, I kept thinking, people said, you'll be better. So I had this terrible fatigue, and I went and saw a neurologist, and I asked him, you know, what about this, and what can I do with the fatigue and stuff? And he said, this is just normal post-concussion uh, problem, and you should be better within a few weeks. Well, I didn't get better. Things didn't get better. 
I do have something that, that I would share with you all that I learned that people who are older have more trouble with concussions and recovering. The disappointing fact for me was I learned that older they meant 40 years old. <laughs> and I was 58 at that time. And, uh, but anyway, I, I tried to return to work and, thing, and I kept thinking things would get better. And like Terry said, uh, I taught at the family practice residency and I'd given this talk on depression multiple times and I was struggling to write it. And I used to be a good writer. I could kind of weave together ideas and concepts like a tapestry. The harder I worked at this, the worse it got. Andrea can testify that this was terrible. Anyway, I finally just decided the pain and stuff, and I decided, you know, I'm not functional. And I really was glad I saw my own family physician. And he said, you know, you need to stop. Don't try and see your patients one more time. You just need to stop. And I'm very grateful I stopped because none of my patients suffered, none of them uh, committed suicide. I didn't, my limitations didn't cause uh, uh, problems for other people. So I stopped working early in January. And then, even before my brain injury, uh, organization and neatness in my office wasn't my strength. So I was trying to clean out my office for somebody to come in and see my patients work with my partners. And uh, I carried down a whole bunch of books and I was organizing stuff and I carried down, I don't know, four or five boxes. And I slept on, slipped and fell, and this was in February. Well, and we're in still the dumb, dumber, dumbest category. I went back up, carried down a few more boxes, and I thought, you know, this really hurts a lot. So I drove home and I told Andrew, I think we need to go to the hospital. And sure enough, I'd fallen and broken my fibula. And uh, on this I want to tell a story about because it's such ironic contrast. Now I have a cast on my leg. People are so solicitous. Let me open the door for you at church. Uh, you can ride in one of those little motorized carts at what was then cops. Everybody was very concerned. This was the least of my problems. This was a very tangible thing. People could see it. People knew what to do with it. They put a cast on it. It was inconvenient. You, you had more trouble sleeping. You had to wear plastic stuff if you took a shower or something. But this, this got all kinds of attention, all kinds of understanding. But it was time limited. It was inconvenient. The brain injury has turned out to be lifelong. It was really life changing. So then I was kind of wandering in the wilderness. I didn't really know what it was doing. So when I finally got my cast off, I went, and I don't mean this to be critical of physicians and times have improved, but since I practiced in Appleton for a long time, I still see people uh, in informal consults who fall between the cracks in the system. I saw a physiatrist twice. Uh, first time I explained what I'm gonna talk about, brain brownout, fatigue, all this kind of stuff. And I went back and saw him a second time and said, you know, these are the problems. Can you do something to help me? He said, I don't have anything to offer except tincture of time, just passage of time. So I said, well, could you send me someplace? Could you refer me to someplace? And I, I don't have the anger I did or years ago. He said, go look it up on the internet. <laughs> well, I'd gone to school in medicine uh, when people either wrote handwritten notes or they dictated into a phone and somebody typed up the stuff. I didn't know how to use computers. It became very clear that, you know, the person with a brain injury should not be their own case manager. And it really burned me because I'd, you know, sent people to Mayo's or Chicago or Madison, it's had a couple of people admitted to the National Institutes of Mental Health. So we didn't know what to do. And we finally, uh, Andrea and I went to the Brain Injury Association of Wisconsin State Conference in Stevens Point and met a couple of people from the Mayo Clinic and ultimately got to go over there. Prior to that, I tried to get myself in, but it got in the wrong phone line and stuff. And then later on, I wanted to become a more effective advocate and teach people about brain injury. So I did a five semester distance learning class from George Washington University, which has kind of the definitive program on traumatic brain injury and special education. I was the only person in the class with a brain injury. 
I was the only person in my age cohort by about 20 to 30 years. All these were young professionals who were therapists, OT, PT, speech and language therapists for people with brain injuries. Uh, I learned a lot from them. I enjoyed knowing them, but I was struggling to learn how to use a computer. Uh, I'm not going to tell that story. So what were the major problems for me? And I think this is true for many people who have a brain injury. At first, I was really ignorant. I didn't know what was going on. When they said mild, I took that to mean insignificant. And uh, I'm very glad that the x-ray showed uh, evidence of a subarachnoid bleed or, and a subdural hematoma, because otherwise I would have felt so guilty. Uh, I should have been able to get myself over this. I should have just tried harder. Uh, I'll give you an example of the pain when we get to fatigue, but it was just all encompassing. And it's kind of like, you know, in the middle of the winter, we get used to, say, 20 degree temperatures. It's not cold anymore, but we've been acclimated into that. That's what had happened with the pain. The fatigue was probably the biggest problem for me, it's just this. Uh, overwhelming fatigue. And my automatic behaviors was, well, all through my life, if you had a problem, what you did is you worked harder, tried harder, and things got better. This was exactly the opposite for here. The sensitivity to external stimuli, I got so I couldn't really go to church. I'd have to leave because of the music. I grew up in Kansas, so I liked basketball. I learned that watching basketball was terrible for me, watching TV at all. Later on, I learned I like to read. That was not good. Or I could do that for a certain amount of time. Initially, when we started going to the Mayo Clinic, I thought, you know, the husband father should be able to drive back and forth. That would leave me wiped out for a couple of days. Finally, Andrea and I learned to trade off at about an hour, hour and a half, and then I would kind of meditate. And what I call brain brownout, and I think this is an important concept for people who know people who have brain injuries or if you had one, is the harder I would concentrate, the more I would focus. It would be like a flashlight battery. It would get dimmer and dimmer after a certain amount of time. I just couldn't sustain it. And I guess the best model I have is, you know, if you have a flashlight and it's growing dimmer and dimmer because the battery is gone, willing the battery to be stronger doesn't work. And then what I, I'm talking with you now about some of the things that got worse, particularly when I was fatigued, I was fortunate enough to be a vice moderator of our church, and I kind of offered to resign. They said, no, no, stay. And then, so I did, but I found that it took more and more effort to not be a smart aleck, to keep my emotions in control, not to fly off the handle, not to be irritable. And I thought I'd been pretty good at that. I mean, I'd spent... Uh, 20-some years as a psychiatrist, I learned to handle all kinds of things. Same kind of thing with medical school. Uh, but it just took more control. And I guess the example I had was sitting in a church congregational meeting and everybody talking, and I just felt this urge to say, does anyone have anything else pertinent to say? <laughs> and I restrained myself. The other thing that was really devastating to me about the brain injury was loss of self. And I think this happens to most people who've sustained a brain injury. You're not able to be the person you used to be. But other people don't have any idea how hard you're trying. I mean, I'd been a physician for more than half my life. Uh, most of us, or many of us, much of our self-identity is tied up in what kind of work we do. That certainly was the case for me provides structure for your life, provides social interaction, has all kinds of meanings. And now, all of a sudden, I was this person who couldn't do much of anything. And this, this is an important thing, uh, the concept of the window of awareness. When I finally ended up at the Mayo Clinic, I saw a neuropsychologist, uh, neurologist, a physical medicine person, and uh, somebody who became my cognitive therapist, and she had the hardest job of all. 
She said, stop when you're tired and stop when you hurt. Well, all my life, you know, as a physician, it's kind of like being a mother. You, you just do what has to be done. So I was really clueless, and I'd really gotten so I was just not able to recognize that. She finally said, you know, you just need to stop every hour and a half and meditate. Put your mind at rest and don't think about anything. Well, that is terribly hard <laughs> if you've ever tried to do that. I had, I had a kind of benefit because I was doing this in the summer and I bought a hammock and I got it in the side yard and listened to the birds and watched the leaves and looked at the clouds and that helped. Not found a winter equivalent. But what I discovered was I was probably over here with both the pain and the fatigue somewhere between the 85 and 95 percent. And what happened would be, you know, you'd start to try and put your mind at rest, not do things, and there'd be a graph. I'd become more aware of how much I hurt, but then I'd begin to feel guilty. I'm just going to be a slug. I ought to try harder. I ought to do more. Uh, I finally learned to uh, do that pretty regularly. The tool they gave me was using a day timer regularly, build in these rest periods in your life. And so I can function at a better level if I stay within my limits. Um, but this is a kind of ongoing thing. But I think the concept of window of awareness is really important. Otherwise, you just, what I call the wily e. coyote syndrome. If I get going past that point, say, for me, the window of awareness is 45 to 65, let's say. If I get into 70, then I just am no longer able to be aware. It's almost like somebody who's had too much alcohol. They're not aware of themselves in the same way. And that's a danger point. Talking about alcohol brings me, I didn't ever become alcoholic, but I certainly found that I probably misused alcohol for a number of reasons. I misused it partly because it helped with the pain, helped with the fatigue, it blocked out things. And my problem, one of my problems was I would run out of me before the day ran out of hours. I mean, I would just stop being able to be functional, and so how do I fill that time? And it helped with the whole thing I said about loss of self. And so what are some of the persistent problems? Fatigue is still a problem. I now know enough that I can kind of lay it out like a thermometer. I know when I'm going to get, you know, I, uh, if I catch it soon enough. Uh, organizational skills have not improved. Um, trouble initiating and stopping. And, and this one, the self-awareness, self-control, I think is a major problem for people with brain injuries. Um, emotional issues, cognitive issues, uh, how long can I concentrate? How well am I able to think about abstract things? And the sensory overload. I still struggle with that. It's gotten easier to manage in some ways because I now have hearing aids and I just take them out. But that's frequently not enough. So now moving from kind of a, a personal example to what happened, whoops, I guess I was disorganized. I forgot to put this one in. But this is a picture of me in kind of my initiation organization stage. But what happens in a traumatic brain injury? Really, there are two types of traumatic brain injuries. One is an open injury where the integrity of the skull is violated. Think of something like gunshot wound or a skull fracture, a depressed skull fracture. The more common ones are called closed head injuries. It's important to know that the skull doesn't have to be hit, the head doesn't have to be hit. You can think of examples like shaken baby syndrome or think of examples like whiplash. You can also then have, obviously, direct contact, falls, uh, sports injuries, that kind of thing. Uh, different areas of the brain provide different functions. and living in today's world, we're really dependent on uh, functions in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe primarily. And those are the parts of the brain that are almost always damaged no matter where the insult is. I fell on the back of my head. Almost all my uh, injury was to the, my frontal lobe and that's where my symptoms come from. Uh, 
symptoms can be focal and local if, uh, you know, it's, it's precise things, say like a stab wound or a gunshot wound. More often than not, they're generalized. And this is just an example of what happens. One reason the frontal and temporal lobes are more damaged is if you look at the interior of the skull, that kind of bony ridge, that's where the brain moves back and forth across. And I think of the brain kind of like an old-fashioned paddle ball. The brain and the skull move with different velocities. So if you fall or hit, uh, this is an example of what happens to the brain in, say, whiplash. Same kind of thing could happen if somebody has a concussion in sports or other things where, you know, where places their head on the big concrete sidewalk. Your brain moves back and forth. And you, those are the areas of your brain that are more likely to be damaged. And our brain has the consistency of kind of partially formed jello. It floats in the cerebral spinal fluid. The skull is there to protect it, but it doesn't protect it from its internal damage. That's part of what happens. The other thing that happens is the outside of our brain is called gray matter. The big part inside is called white matter. The white matter is the axons. And if you look over there on the left, that's what a healthy axon looks like. And when your brain is moving, the axons can be stretched, torn, twisted, and by and large, they don't repair themselves. I think of it, you can regain some compensatory skills. You can rewire, in my mind, parts of the brain. It's a little bit like stringing um, communication wires, telephone wires, that kind of stuff after a bad ice storm up here. The temporary ones aren't as good as the ones before. This stuff is important because none of this can be seen on CAT scan or MRI or PET scan. These are all too small to see. So if somebody says, well, gee, I, I can't have a concussion or I can't have a brain injury because I had a normal CT scan, I had a normal MRI, uh, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't keep them from having symptomatic concussion or brain injury. Uh, the definitive uh, diagnosis is really uh, neuropsych testing, uh, which is really expensive, and there aren't a lot of neuropsychologists around. So these, this is what you lose when you have impairment of the frontal lobe. And you just think about what do we need to function with today in society? being aware of mental flexibility, being able to inhibit responses, being able to plan, judgment, problem solve. Because I know some people, one of my physicians actually said, you know, he was sure that his father had a traumatic brain injury, but he was a dairy farmer 75 years ago, and he can, had the routine, he could continue to function in that level. He didn't face challenges that exposed the limits of what he could do. And the temporal lobe, memory and learning, the important thing is previously learned memory is intact. It's the new learning that's more difficult. It takes me a lot longer and a lot more effort to learn and master things now than it did before. Um, my hearing loss is due to age, not to my brain injury. And then the cognitive things, this is pretty clear. You have to be alert. These are a cascade of things. But you can see, particularly the executive function, is what's really uh, the major, uh, now I'm talking about non-limited, uh, non-paralyzed, uh, non-vegetative states. I'm talking about people walking around with a brain injury, functioning kind of in the world. Um, I gave you some examples of how organized I was in that picture. But this being aware of thinking changes in yourself, that's really crucial. This self-awareness frequently goes away. Uh, and this is some of the times when I've not always been grateful to my wife when she says, you need to go take a rest period. Um, and also knowing your own limits. I mean, we had people over for dinner because they'd had us over a number of times. And I thought, well, I'll try and do what they did. Make a main dish, appetizer, side dishes, dessert. Well, on two occasions, Adria was someplace else, and I was doing all this. 
and I ended up in the emergency room getting stitches in my hands uh, on two occasions. I took a knife skills course, but that wasn't the solution. I just learned that I had to modify my expectations. But I think if you think of the impairment that comes from the brain injury, you can see how that may also make it harder for the person to be self-aware and to make the compensatory strategies. Children have a lot of brain injuries and this slide is important because these were all people who were hospitalized and after hospitalized, being hospitalized, fewer than 2% of them had special education, although almost 20% of them had cognitive problems. A person named Wayne Gordon did a study of the special education classes in the Denver school system and found about 40% of the people had really TBI as their underlying diagnosis. Statistically, um, the number of people uh, who should be in special ed or should be diagnosed with uh, traumatic brain injury uh, should be about 500,000. And at the time of this study, only 24,000 had that particular diagnosis, so about 5%. It's harder in children to make the diagnosis. In fact, frequently the time lag between the injury and the diagnosis is about five years. One of the things that makes it hard is you can't expect somebody to have a skill. You can't expect to see the deficit before the person should have a skill. We have a lot of expectations that are different for somebody who's 16 years old versus six years old. You don't see that impulse control or the behavior kinds of things before the deficit. And what happens also is there's the initial loss, but later on the new skills are not able to be able to be learned. And many, some studies show that people who are teenagers, young adults, who've had a brain injury aren't able to read the social cues of other people like teenagers can. This next slide is one of my favorites. It applies to schools, but it also applies to adults, applies to people returning to work who've had a brain injury. If you think about first grade to 12th grade, the support and context is really good in the first grade. One teacher, one classroom, one consistent thing. And the content is relatively smooth and understandable. As you go through school, you get more content, more demands intellectually, but you also lose the support. So you have multiple classrooms, multiple different classmates, different st and this is frequently one of the places this kind of stress is what exposes the deficit. Somebody could function pretty well in the third grade, but they're in the seventh grade, they can't function as well. Actually, the same thing in my mind applies to adults. You come back from, say, Afghanistan, and you have children who are two years old and four years old. You have a little trouble with impulse control. You have a little trouble managing your anger, a little short fused. Ten years later, they're 14 and 16. Your limitations are exposed in a way that they weren't when they were two and four. And I think that often leads to people who then don't really know what the problem is and it gets called something else. So there are a lot of benefits from recognizing it early. You can make some helpful interventions. You can educate the person, educate the family. I really see traumatic brain injury as a family illness. I used to see manic depressive illness or depression, severe mental illnesses as really a family illness because it affects everybody who cares about the person and their interactions with other people affects the whole system. And this is just kind of some of the problems that I'm going to talk about as far as the public health part. What happens if there's no awareness, no treatment? Increased mental illness, particularly depression, also the anxiety disorders, PTSD, OCD, higher risk for suicide, Substance abuse, alcohol can be a cause of brain injury, but it can be also uh, self-medicating, as I talked about. Uh, this is just gives you pre-injury, 50% to, to two-thirds of people were using alcohol. What happens is uh, TBI and substance abuse risk, four times as likely to try to kill yourself, seven times more likely. 
I really think there should be a tri diagnosis. We had gotten, when I was still practicing, people talked a lot about dual diagnosis substance abuse and mental illness. Oftentimes there's all three, but what happens is you make a diagnosis that you can think of. Uh, in medical school, the maxim was you can't make a diagnosis you don't consider. So if you're an alcohol counselor or if you're a mental health professional, you're more likely to see the world without considering the traumatic brain injury. Uh, this is just the statistics about jail. Three to times is more likely to 10 times is more likely to have a brain injury. And you heard me talk about some of the cognitive skills, planning, organization, being able to control impulse. Uh, that to me is one of the reasons that these people get caught. They also commit different kinds of crimes, more crimes against person versus crimes against property. And I think that's, again, because of trouble with impulse control, short fuse, emotional lability. And domestic violence is clearly a case. I'm going to talk about a project we're doing in Appleton in a little while. But 90% of the head injuries are around the head and neck. And uh, a different study said about 92% of the people had had head and neck injuries in the last year. 75% had more than one partner inflicted injury. Uh, you can also see if somebody has a TBI and is in a domestic abuse center, how much harder it would be for them to leave the relationship. How do I plan? How do I get organized? How do I manage my emotions? How all the stuff we were talking about you need to do. And veterans, I was surprised by this statistic too. About 80% of the people who in the military who have TBI weren't in combat, but they do dangerous things, military training, they are in an atmosphere of young adult men, frequently with uh, alcohol, uh, frequently with fighting, that kind of thing. And if you have a veteran with a TBI, you're much more likely to be homeless, two or three times as likely. And this is a long five-year longitudinal study of 310. I mean, most of the slides I've shown you, I think, are all good, reputable studies. But this is a large uh, study done by the Department of the VA. Homelessness is what I became particularly interested in. As I mentioned, I thought the primary causes were substance abuse and uh, mental illness. Uh, Wang studied about 90 pe uh, 900 people in Toronto and found 50% had TBI. Wilder is the person who uh, does a every three year study in Minnesota and they found about 30%. And the TBI often happens before the person becomes homeless and it most often is mild. And I think that means it's frequently not recognized either by the person or by the persons in their environment. And it occurs at a young age. Now, this is the age that the brain injury happened, not the age that the person becomes homeless. But once again, you can see that the mild is the predominant level of injury. Um, if we have time, I'll tell you a couple more stories about that. This is just the same uh, data again. And this is more meaningful to me because it's the data presented in a visual way. And if you look at this, here's when the person becomes homeless. The vast majority of those happen before. And they can happen a long time before. One of the people I've talked with at the Homeless Connection had been homeless for about 10 to 15 years. He had an indentation in his forehead. Nobody had ever asked him about, did he ever have a brain injury? Did he have trouble concentrating? Did he have trouble processing? And if somebody finally asked him, and they said, oh, yeah. He said, I had this. How did you get that? Well, my friend and I, we were hitting golf balls at each other. <laughs> and this hit me. And he could then describe what limitations he had and how they fit with what we're talking about. And this is just another pitch for thinking of all three diagnoses, mental illness, uh, brain injury, and substance abuse. There was a study in uh, Baltimore of 
people who had uh, substance abuse and were homeless and also had mental illness, uh, they diagnosed about 89% of those people also had a brain injury. So what are they typically described as? These seem to fit. What are the deficits? You don't seem motivated. Can't plan ahead. Don't follow through. Um, the one I didn't put up there that uh, has always bothered me the most is unable to benefit from treatment. And frequently that means that there's not the appropriate treatment available. Uh, at least in the Appleton area, I'm not aware of any of the substance abuse treatment programs that have been modified to work with people with the limitations of a brain injury. It's like trying to treat people who have severe PTSD in a kind of non-adapted environment. People can't concentrate long enough, they get flooded, they can't uh, focus, they can't remember. Uh, I have a strong feeling, that, you know, sometimes therapists or other people are fearful of en being enabling to somebody. A person misses several appointments, my solution is you need to find another way. Calling the person to remind them of the appointment is no more enabling than taking a wheelchair out to a medivan to bring somebody in who has trouble walking. But I think that's not the concept we have. So if people get called irresponsible, non-compliant, you missed two appointments, we're not going to see you again. Now I want to talk to you briefly about what I think is an exciting project. It's called Brain Fox Valley. Um, we have a grant from the U.S. Venture of Basic Needs and J.J. Keller Foundation. We um, had been at this, basically, this got born as an idea back in 2014. And the Community Foundation funded, uh, brought together a, uh, housing providers, also people from county mental health, other mental health providers, substance abuse treatment providers, uh, sheltered employment providers, uh, a wide range, Goodwill, uh, I've forgotten some of the others. Anyway, they uh, here are the sites that were involved as far as this part. Homeless Connection, uh, Warming Shelter, Harbor House, Christine Ann, the Domestic Abuse Center in Oshkosh, and the Mooring Programs, which is a residential uh, substance abuse treatment program. We got all the staff of these places together and asked them to guess how many people they thought of their clients, what percent had brain injuries? They guessed 12 percent. We started to teach them about brain injury, how, what it was, what it was like. We gave them a test beforehand and afterwards. They scored about 50 percent beforehand and about 80 percent afterwards. We instructed them in how to do what's called Ohio State Screening Tool for Brain Injury, which is probably the, the gold standard. Uh, and then they collected eight months of data. And what they found was, this is an unusual study because the men and in, women are about equal numbers um, because of the two domestic abuse centers. About 54% of the people had brain injuries or head injuries enough to lose consciousness. What we haven't done is a, a neat study to see what their cognitive impairment was. But when you listen to the staff, they're really excited about this because they say, you know, it gives us much more understanding, we have much more empathy, we have, we can develop strategies. Somebody that we thought was non-compliant, irresponsible, um, just didn't care. We were giving them the instructions in a crowded hallway with other people around. We took them to a room by themselves and explained the things, and sure enough, they were starting to vacuum the living room just like we asked. They said, now we can understand the problems better, we can define the problems better, and we can make much more useful interactions. And that to me was probably, this is just a graph of the percentage. Of, uh, but I think they were really amazed. I was somewhat amazed too. And this is just what they talked about, how they could be much more effective in helping their clients. And that really has rippled through the whole system. The purpose of this particular grant right now is to help people um, devise a, a program so they can maybe do a three-year study to see do these interventions make a difference because all around the country people have counted the percentage of people who are homeless 
but nobody has ever tried to make an intervention and see if it makes a difference. And it can be just simple, like I told you, as far as giving the instructions uh, in a way that the person can follow them. And accommodations, it's much easier to change the environment than the person. Just moving them to a quiet place. And I already told you this about the wheelchair. And, uh, and this is important. Uh, we live in an appendectomy society. Name the problem appendicitis. Do something, appendectomy, you're done, and go on your way. Uh, and for a long time, uh, brain injury was treated that way. In fact, just recently, as recently as uh, 2010, was the first article by the professional in a professional journey as traumatic brain injury as a chronic disease process. And it labels a lot of the metabolic and medical problems that uh, can be following up a, a brain injury, as well as the ones uh, that are more immediate, like we've talked about. And like I said, I think it affects everybody, the community. And I guess that's part of why I'm saying it's not just the individual, the family, the school, the work, but if you look at the cost of the community, and when I talked about $76 billion being a cost to society, um, uh, oops, uh, the $76 billion, uh, that's in 2010 dollars, uh, it's about $85 billion. But that doesn't include any of the social costs. That doesn't include cost of incarceration, cost of homelessness, cost of domestic violence, cost of uh, all these other things. Well, as I mentioned, I think you know it affects all of this. So I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to be able to talk with you and. Uh, hopefully uh, educate you some about what traumatic brain injury is and what the cost is to society as well as individuals. So I'm open for questions. bunch of recommended resources and I'll want to highlight a couple of them. Go ahead. <coughs> I just woke up when you went to Braille. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a cognitive remediation or cognitive therapy. And what it really does is it teaches the person how to manage and increase the reserves they have. Uh, for me, it was uh, meeting with a cognitive therapist on a regular basis. It's really hard to learn that stuff because you have to unlearn a whole bunch of other stuff. But if you think of the concept of, you know, I only have so many brain bucks and how am I spending them? And how do I begin to allocate them? Uh, I've given a talk to the National Health Care for the Homeless Coalition, and they have 383 clinics, but none of their people were screening for brain injury because they said there's no treatment. Well, there's not a pill, there's not a magical intervention, there's not a surgical procedure. It's just hard work teaching people how to manage. That's, that's the essence of it. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of veterans, excuse me. Go ahead. I can hear. Okay. In the case of veterans who are coming back from combat, who are often, they may have had TBIs, mm -hmm. but they also may have had post-traumatic stress. And I can see how a, a brain injury could um, aggravate post-traumatic stress, stress, but how do the professionals tease those two problems apart? Is there a way to tell? The there, there's a lot of symptoms? debate. There, there's a lot of debate on that. And when you listen to the clinicians, frequently you come out with people have both. And the question was about how do you tease apart post-traumatic stress and uh, uh, brain injury in somebody? And I think what you end up doing is frequently treating both simultaneously. The 
is the treatment fairly similar? That part I can't answer. I, I because so many of the symptoms are the same. Yeah. Um, is what I've learned tonight, mm -hmm. at least on the book. You know, I've, I've read some stuff, but I'm not able to recall it correctly enough. To, there's a number of VA systems people who are doing exactly what you're talking about. And I can't tell you how they do it. As a medical doctor, I'm surprised that the only pain meds you took that first year was red wine, which looked pretty good, but I'm wondering. Oh no, I took some other stuff. Were there, were there opioids or Tylenol, and would you recommend that or no? No, I, um, I was on uh, uh, Darvacet and 100s, and uh, also I was taking ibuprofen, 800 milligrams, three times a day, so I took some other pills to keep my stomach from rotting away. Um, and I think looking back on it, I wish that I hadn't been on some of those. I wish. Uh, I think that was closer to being the standard of treatment at that time, and um, I, I think the goal is you want to help people alleviate as much pain as possible, but you want to have more in your toolbox than just prescription medicine. Mm -hmm. Another question? I just want to mention that I had a career in baseball four years ago, and of all places, I on a wellness trail before I was going to teach a night class. And it just brings tears to my eyes, you know, just listening to you, because it has been a journey. And um, to give you an example, I have a cane with me tonight because the fatigue of things not being automatic anymore I cannot maintain, probably at the end of the night, I will have trouble walking to my car, but I walked in here perfectly normal. But there, um, I think for me, it, it would be to say don't give up. Um, I am seeing researchers that are working with me, but boy, um, you know, it can take seven, eight years, and you may never, you know, and it is chronic. I think you're making an excellent point because yeah. sometimes people used to say at a certain stage you will reach maximum recovery. Yeah. I'm clearly getting better. I think some of it has to do with I'm smarter at managing, but I think also there's some brain plasticity. Yeah. But you're right. It, and, um, you know, I couldn't have driven over here by myself and done this. My wife drove me over. She'll drive me back. Uh, but I can identify. and. Yes, and, and that's how I ended up falling, breaking my leg. I'm sure I was fatigued. I had lost my balance. Uh, I know more now than I did then. In, in something, uh, you know, when you said that you were happy, you had some physical. Um, I blew out my orbital bone, and I had to have a plastic surgeon put a Teflon implant in. I shudder to think of people that would not have believed you had an injury because the brain injury does not show up on the imaging. Yes. My husband had, he reminds me of you right now. I've been going through this for two years. He fell at Walmart. The same thing you're going through right now. But they're trying to use pills to calm him, do everything. And they're done with them, they said. I've got another question back here. I, I think the trick is to find and uh, to find somebody who's really interested in brain injury who really knows something about it. I mean, we look at He's on off. cabobentin, and that stuff is wicked. He's on three in the morning, three in the afternoon, and three at night. It's hell. <laughs> and it's like, what do you do, you know? Yeah. Another question? Yeah. 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 Yeah older and had um, concussions as a younger adult in sports, etc. And now with the advanced age, we're seeing more falls and repeated head injuries. And so we're seeing a relationship between um, like exacerbated mental faculty, loss of mental faculties, and other things that are occurring, um, changes in personality, memory, etc. Have you um, much information related to the dementia or the um, 
repeated falls have happened to someone who's had the illness, the injuries as a child, and now they're eating them as an adult, as an older adult? I think if you've had one brain injury, you increase your likelihood of having another by four times. If you've had two, you increase by eight times. There's clearly some literature saying that, you know, there's a relationship between traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's disease. Um, I don't know a good answer about when they're that far apart. My sense is that, you know, you've already predisposed and maybe had symptoms that you don't recognize. But you have to also remember that, you know, 75% of the people who had concussions returned to normal. And so it's not like we can put ourselves in bubble wrap. So uh, I think some of that stuff is, I don't know. Uh. I heard you talk a lot tonight about the treatment of the primary symptoms of TBI, but I also heard you speak to the affective component. So what happens after we sustain TBI emotionally? Experiencing anger, guilt, things like disappointment, other things like that. Do you think there's a place for adjustment and grief counseling in acquired TBI? And what's effective? Uh, well, when I ended up over there, they said, you're depressed. They wanted to put me on antidepressants. I said, no, I'm not depressed. I'm just reacting with grief to this. Mm -hmm. Well, I ended up taking the antidepressants, and, and they were right. I ended up also in some uh, cognitive therapy, really learning uh, what are my limits, how to live within them, and switching the goal, giving up the goal of I want to be who I was. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a grief. That's a genuine loss. And the model I use is if I try to be who I was, I could never be it. If I get down here and live within my circle of competence, then I can push that circle out some. Uh, I tend to think that psychotherapy is helpful for that kind of stuff. I think it's really a normal grief reaction. Uh, you think of something that's taken away from you that's truly important. Yourself, who I used to be, and, and that's invisible. Nobody else, I mean, it, and it's hard to explain. I mean, I've tried to explain this to people. When I went back to work, you know, I looked pretty normal. People were really pressuring me to get in the call schedule. I spent a lot of time in my first year or two trying to teach people who didn't want to learn what brain injury was. They had their own agenda. They, they wanted me to do something or not do something. So I think that, you know, the, and I think just it begins to be learning to master. For me, at least, I know all of my emotional trouble, my judgment, everything gets worse if I get too fatigued. Uh, but it's really hard. I have to, you know, I took a nap before I came over here. Um, it's hard to live within the limitations, but I think as the point was made earlier, things can improve, and I guess I've moved to being kind of cautiously optimistic, and I don't always like it. Uh, I'm not sure if you ask my wife how mellow I was all the time. I'm not going to do that. Uh, hi, my name's Lori. Um, I'm just wondering about the sensory overload, so I, I am a TBI sufferer and survivor, multiple different causes, um, but so bear with me. A couple of comments I wanted to make is in answer to what can we do to help, um, and also a retired healthcare person, so I have similar, um, uh, yeah, self-diagnosed complicated grief <laughs> syndrome, but how do you get through it? Um, one thing you mentioned about a, a symptom or a problem in the TBI is the sensory sensitivity. I'll call it sensitive overstimulation. Yeah, and then my function, even like my speech, will lessen that. A, a couple things, finding ways, uh, I'm having a flight of ideas about it. <laughs> the catch-22 of medicate the anxious, annoyed, uh, overstimulated, frustrated person, then you become the cycle. So then you become, you medicate that person with the abacantum or abacantum or whatever to soften their hypersensitivity, then they become, I, you, become more susceptible to falls, to another fracture, another injury. Um, so with that line of thought, I wanted to comment on how helpful I found it to um, find ways to 
softly soothe the senses, like you talked about the hammock and the birds. Um, for me, just using something of nature, whittling or wood or holding a seashell, something of nature, some, or doing something soothing, um, closing my eyes during a lecture, not to fall asleep, but to limit the overload. And then my question, have you or other people um, had any experience with the role of for neuroplasticity and improvement? Um, things like minerals, herbs, and um, dietary, nutritional. One thing I'm thinking of in particular is magnesium uh, is used in the brain. I hope anybody's studying that, magnesium and brain function, neuroplasticity. Thank you. I don't have uh, enough knowledge to comment on the dietary uh, supplement kind of stuff. I do really recognize what you're talking about, soothing. I mean, what, early on it, when it, I went and took a yoga class, I do that. I really try and do meditation. I try and identify particularly problem areas that are going to be occurring. If I can anticipate problems, then I can kind of go in. You can't save up cognitive energy, but I can go in with my credit card all paid off. <laughs> I, I can go in where I don't have any accumulated debt. I mean, I couldn't have uh, been leaf blowing all afternoon and come over here and given a talk. Uh, but the self-soothing, I think different people find different strategies. Um, and I think, for me at least, one of the hardest things and one of the things that contributed to the alcohol misuse was how do you fill your time? I mean, people who have not had a brain injury, this is a kind of, what do I do with my time? I have this burden of unstructured time. Things I like to do, I can't do. I can't read for very long, I can't watch TV. Uh, things that I were really meaningful. For me, it was really helpful to find something tangible that I could contribute. I joke that I'm sure that Andrea paid the cognitive therapist for me to become the meal planner, cook, and all that stuff. But it was a, a way of contributing, a way of doing something tangible. And I think that having something that you can see uh, helps. Even, uh, but I'm kind of like you. It was helpful to have uh, a demonstrable uh, thing, not only for other people, but for me, because I would have just kept trying harder and gotten more and more in a mess. I just wanted to say, Dr. Tom, that, and to the audience, that one of the things that I found helpful is I have a business card printed up so that I can hand it to the bus driver when I get on the bus, and they can read it, and I don't have to stand there and explain that um, you're a new bus driver, so I have to tell you that I have this sleep disorder, and I have this and that, and you may need to do this. It gives them something they have on hand that they keep on the, they keep associated with me, mm -hmm. so that once they get to recognize me, then they know who I am, and I don't scare them anymore. That's helpful. And one of the other things I found is to have a therapist that is trained in dealing in, um, particularly, now my therapist is trained in behavior, VA rehab. And so between my therapist and a primary care physician who um, will communicate with my therapist, who communicates with physical therapy, who communicates with my neurologist, who they all communicate in a relationship that is um, so symbiotic that they actually check their emails before they see me. And that is something that you have to foster between the medical personnel, whether you bring yourself or someone else, is that communication. And to communicate with family members and give the family members the freedom to ask questions and have answers, whether it be a limited, you know, limited way or not. But those are things that we can do ourselves to advocate for ourselves and for others. I think you're absolutely right. And that brings me to this recommended resources that I handed out. There are some really favorites for me, and I'd like to kind of highlight them and suggest that some of these you may want to read. One of them is uh, from Texas. You can get it on the internet. It talks about, uh, it's on page two, TBI materials for professionals. There's this, if you get the one for uh, how physicians can manage and met, uh, modify their office practice, it helps you to know what to ask. 
because you figured out what to ask. I for sure didn't know what to ask in the beginning. I was uh, lucky enough to finally find a team that was a team of different people. And they saw me, and they communicated with each other. They saw me and my wife. But this one on, uh, by Margaret Stretchen for primary care physicians. Um, the other one I'd really highlight is uh, BrainLine, which is probably the definitive resource. It's uh, partly the Defense Department and probably part of what used to be public radio. And then down under students and schools, this Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children, this is the REAP program. If I were able to have a magic wand, I would try and get this in, into all the schools in Wisconsin. I think, I think Iowa is now in the process of doing that. Uh, but this is a way that the accommodation for the student is really appropriate because it ap applies to the lagging part, which is the intellectual function part that comes back last. Um, the, and the other one, uh, learn that number four in the first general information, it's from New York and it's written for students and teachers and stuff. But it's, it's nice because it has a lot of things listed by problem. And then it says, put, recommends some solutions that could be used at home, could be used in the classroom and stuff. But it's kind of a nuts and bolts kind of uh, collection of suggestions. But I particularly like the one for physicians because I think most of us with a brain injury, we don't know what to ask for at first. I mean, I sure, sure didn't. Uh, and what you're describing as far as a team reminds me of one other thing, the Brain Injury Alliance of Wisconsin. You can now contact them and they'll print off a little laminated card for you that says I've had a brain injury. And this came in part from somebody who had a brain injury who would have to stop and sleep in rest areas because he would get so fatigued he felt like he was uh, dangerous to drive on and, and police kept stopping him so he got a hold of the uh, Carl Curtis at the brain injury and they started making these. I think the Brain Injury Alliance of Wisconsin is a helpful resource as well. But I think what you're touching on in some ways is I think there's it's still a struggle to find out people who are really interested and willing and want to work with people who've had brain injuries. There are, um, it looks like some people didn't get the handout. We, we, could, we, could, try, we could try and have copies available for you next week for the next, the next program. I, I, oh, there are some here. There's some here. I think there were plenty. I do think we have to wrap it up. We still have to stack chairs and get ourselves put away for the evening, but let's give Tom Tabak a round of applause.